lecture we saw about th four different memory models that is basically <coughs> they include segmentation and paging in different uh, ways. Okay. Now, let us quickly take a look at it as part of the program CPU generates an 8 bit address right. So, it is there as part of the pro program. Now, when you have an 8 bit address sorry when you have an n bit address huh? when you have an n bit address that is general it doesn't mean that uh, you are going to have those many memory locations okay so in general again what you say is you have as the address space size is 2 to the power n okay since we do not know that it may or may not really be available that is physically be available we say okay as far as the user is concerned it is available and so we call this as the virtual address space. What we mean is if it is not physically available this particular thing is going to be in the disk that is okay, this we have seen earlier fine. Now <coughs> we had seen uh, different arrangements such as pages and segments. Now, what is the rational behind these things? Essentially, this address space is logically divided, okay? Logically divided um, into different functional, okay? They are logically divided into different portions, in which functionally you will find one particular unit, such as, um, say, just the code or the program. Okay, or the data in general or that particular portion may be used for some temporary storage that is stack and so on or even if you take specifically data structure for instance you can have <coughs> a logically cohesive unit that is a single unit for storing let us say tables okay. say some tables or uh, array of data and so on so forth. Now, this the programmer really is uh, concerned with because the logical part of it is uh, more programmers. Okay. Now, <coughs> in contrast with this what we are going to have is the physical part that is pages and the physically existing memory and so on so forth. Now, since we do not know about the size of each of these that is going to vary from application to application and so generally we say that whatever the, the particular space divided into some uh, logically divided into some units okay we say that uh, we call them as segments okay we call these as segments and uh, within a segment you are going to have one or the other type of information okay so we talk about a code segment or a data segment or a stack segment and so on so forth okay but the size of it is going to vary from application to application and so we say that segment size okay is meaningful to have it as variable okay so we talk about a variable segment size now when portions of these segments are brought into the memory so that the CPU may finally access them, right? Well, unless CPU accesses, there is not going to be any 
program execution, is it not? So, CPU accesses the memory and the portions of this will have to be brought into the memory. At that point in time, where we talk about pages, that is in other words, when portions of these segments are brought into the memory, we talk about pages. And so, it is meaningful when we talk about pages to have fixed size, right? Fixed size and this is in the physical memory, whereas this particular one would be essentially in the disk, all right. So, now we have to do the address translation accordingly, because the starting point is what we may call as a logical, this is the other term, same as virtual address, we start with that. So, the CPU generates a logical or a virtual address. So, this particular address goes and uh, when the address goes, the appropriate segment to, to which uh, this refers to must be got, right. So, we have first, the, there is a first part, that is the segment must be identified. So, that is the first one. So, how to identify that, that information, okay, uh, segment identification. This information should have been made available earlier itself, say in the form of some tables. So, generally these are called segment tables. So, these tables have the information and so when an ad virtual address comes, the segment in which this particular thing is available will be picked up, okay. And so, you can see that from the logical or the virtual address, first there is one level of translation, some people call this as a linear address, okay. So, this is one level of translation and then this will have to be looked into from the practical point of view that is in terms of the pages in the memory. And so, the next one will be corresponding to this segment identification, what we have is a page identification, okay. Page identification, where is that information available? Again, in some page table. So, actually these are all stored a priori and made available to the system. So, from the page identification now comes the final translation of from the lo logical to physical address, okay. So, that is what it is. In fact, before we considered the logical uh, uh, this one segments, before we considered the segments, we started in fact as if this was the virtual address. So, right, remember the sequence in which we came to this. So, we were only talking about a translation from the logical or the virtual address to physical address and then we saw the reasons why by having pages of fixed size, there can be problem, because how big the page should be, okay. And then we said, okay, let us have fixed page, which is meaningful from practical point of view, but then have variable segment size. So, now with the introduction of segmentation and the segments, we are starting with the virtual address or the logical address to one translation called linear address, from which we come to physical address translation, okay. Now, good. Now, let us just look into the details of this in uh, uh, a little more, uh, okay. <coughs> So, we start with the virtual address, which, which is in the disk, now you know that. So, essentially that particular address will consist of two parts, right, we are calling that as C, offset, what is that virtual address, we already seen. Virtual address essentially is going to identify a segment and so, one part of it will be the segment offset, 
and another part is going to identify the segment itself. Okay. So, generally this one is called segment selector part, okay. something which identifies the segment. Okay. Now, the table is being made use of. So, the table will essentially in uh, uh, stored say in the memory okay. and uh, there may be many entries in that. Okay, some table. So, that table is generally called a segment descriptor table that is this one is going to talk about different types of segments and for each segment there will be one entry. So, that is the table. Some may just call it as a segment table and uh, since the segment table may be loaded anywhere we also said there may be another register okay, which essentially gives where exactly this particular table starts. So, this is a register, this is going to give the origin of the table, some address okay, from where this originates. So, uh, this is just some register, okay, we will come back to this a little later. Now, the register will tell where the table starts and the segment selector will identify which, because it is going to be one entry, not necessarily one byte, okay. there may be a multi byte entry, one entry for each segments that are there. So, the segment selector will identify which segment, or let us say if this is the segment that has been, uh, the, okay. this is the entry which corresponds to the segment that is being identified by that. So, essentially from the start address this okay, information is what is going to be indexed by the selector part, agreed. Okay. So, one entry for each segment. So, there is one segment identified, essentially this is going to give this. <coughs> so, Incidentally, what is this origin address I said? This is the start address of this table okay, indicated. From the start address, okay, how many n entries away this particular thing is identifying. Okay. Now, essentially there will be many entries in this. Okay. I said it is a multi byte uh, entry, there may be many entries. One that is useful from translation point of view is, there is one address called the base address that is given. Okay. That is the base address that will be used. Now, this ad base address will be added to the segment offset. What is this? This is basically, I said this is the entry which describes a specific segment. So, this base address is nothing but the start of that segment, okay, start address of that segment and this tells within that segment how many bytes away okay, the, the specific address is pointing to. So, these two together, okay. now this out, output of this that is the sum of these is the second one that is the linear address, which we are talking about this. What we have done is we have gone into the detail of this. Okay. So, the linear address is generated like this and what is that linear address that is using the linear address the page is going to be identified and then finally, the physical address is it not. Okay. So, essentially this one will consist of we, are, we have seen this uh, we have worked out this earlier. Essentially, this will be giving the page offset that is offset within the page. And uh, remember in our earlier calculation, we had called this as a virtual page earlier. Now, it is not virtual page, but somewhat, okay. some index will be there. So, I will just call it as some index into, uh, what is that? 
this is the one which will identify which page. Like here, we were, it was identifying which segment. Now, this will identify which page. Both are indexed, in fact. Okay, and so we can think of. Ah, we know this, is it not? Page table. Fine. So here is a page table. So, similar to the other arrangement, where the start address or the segment table is indicated by a register, here also we can have another register, which similarly gives the origin of the page table. If that is so, then in case, well, what is a page table? Page table contains entry for each page. Okay. So, the relevant entry for this address will be got basically we should know this one. Okay. This will index into the page table and say similar to this, not different, right? Similar to what we had in the segment, you think here also we have. So, this will basically identify which page and this particular page table. Okay. Among other things, for instance, it may straight away give the uh, page physical page address. We were calling it uh, physical page address, right? That was the thing that was available from here. Or it may just, in other words, it is basically going to tell which page. Okay? So, let us say it identify which page. So, in which case, it is the page number. Page number it identifies. You can see that the different there's no there's no difference between that and this, right? Here we were talking about start address of the segment. Here this is nothing but start address of that page. Okay, it's not different. Now uh, we know that the physical memory is divided, okay, into fixed page size, right? So, suppose this is our starting page, page number 0, fixed, no? So, that is page number 1 and so on and so forth, okay? memories. So, a specific page, whatever is some page, okay, number n. So, that is what this particular thing is going to identify. Let us say if this is a page number n, it is going to identify this is fixed size. No? So, within this, ah, incidentally, what is this? This is our physical memory. We are just putting it as memory. This is nothing but physical memory or DRAM, we were calling it, is it not? So, page number is identified, and this page offset is just. Ah, oh, it is an offset between this one specific address, right. So, that location, so this is one specific location address, address of the location and this may be this particular location may contain an instruction or a data whatever. Agreed. So, ultimately for identifying ah, the contents of a location which will be an instruction or a data, all these things are done, right. Now, the page table will be having information on whether a specific page is available, if so, where it is available and so on. Because we said earlier, any page. Now, this page table will have entries for all the, okay, originally we were calling it as virtual pages, all the pages, right. All of them may or may not be physically present in the memory. So, this will give information whether a particular page is present or not. If it is present, then it will also tell where it is and so on and so forth, okay. Good. So, now you can see that this translation 
from one to the other. So finally, where is our physical address? This, in fact, what I indicated, this, in fact, is the physical address that is of physical address of the location, whatever is this, in fact, is the address. So that is what we had seen from the logical address, translation to linear address, from linear address to physical address. So that is what we have got here. So throughout you can see that essentially the address will, uh, an address vector will consist of two parts. One thing we will have which will identify which part it is, which segment, which page and another part which will identify specifically within that segment or page where exactly it is. Okay? So, it is like having an address x, y, x indicating which area and y indicating which street, something like that or x may be the street, y may be the specific door number, okay? somewhat like that, that is what it is. Good. Now, we had talked about protection, right? Let us uh, talk about that uh, in this context. Because earlier we were mentioning while uh, discussing the page table that the page table entry will have this protection. But after segment was introduced, we said it may be better to have that protection information rather here than there. There is no harm you can have in both places too if necessary. Okay? Now, this segment descriptor table is going to give description of all the segments that are there. Okay. Now, what are the segments? Well, apart from the user point of view, such as the code, data, stack, etc. Now, we know that there is a system and the system may be used by different users. Okay. And the basic characters of system should not be altered at any stage. And it is possible that the different users make use of the same system programs that are available, in which case any user should not corrupt a system program also. So now you can see here, we can talk about system programs and user programs. I will call this as application programs, okay? user programs or application programs. So we have system programs and application programs. That means both are software, both are programs. So we can have, for instance, one segment descriptor table for system and one for the application or the user, right? That is, we can have, right, two different things so that we can always define, find where exactly all the segments related to system software are available. You can have one table there. We can have another table for the applications, that is the from the user point of view, right? You can have two different register itself. In fact, specifically, the system will be used okay, by anyone, any user. Okay? So we say that the system may be accessed in a global manner, whereas all the things that are related to the user, okay, all the things related to the user are more specific or we may say local to that particular user, correct? It is local to that particular user. So, we can have a global table, you can have a local table and uh, what is it? Where are these registers incidentally? They are in the CPU, is it not? So, in other words, what we are talking about is the CPU architecture must include the provision of these registers. Okay? That CPU must support this. In other words, now what we are talking about is the CPU having some extra features for what purpose? For offering protection at software level. Right? 
So, now we really talk about a CPU having these features and possibly another CPU not having these features. Now, you can just see we started our series of lectures talking about a general purpose CPU and a special purpose CPU. That is, in the sense we remember we were talking about it while talking about applications, we said we can essentially consist of the spectrum of applications spanning over a wide range such as data processing applications on one hand and then control oriented applications on the other hand. Now, when we talk about software, essentially what we have is a data processing application. So, a CPU which has this kind of features which will support and protect system software from the user software and so on. So, essentially they are for the data processing application, whereas from control application it may not be that critical, because once designed the CPU and the uh, processor will go into the system itself, it will not be used by different types of users for a specific application something is designed and so we even talk about an embedded controller, right, embedded controller and the CPU that is used for such applications is not is going to be very special, very specific. So, it may not, need not have this kind of features, okay. Some simple way of protecting these things will do, because once the program is uh, developed and loaded it is not going to be altered, agreed, good. Now, let us uh, uh, go to this. Suppose, given a register such as this, at different times if different addresses are loaded, what does it mean? It essentially means at different times, different start address of this table is given, which means different tables are, different tables can be created, okay. Now, it is meaningful possibly if we have 10 users, okay, each user can create his own 10 different tables in addition to the table that may be used for the system or by the system, fine. So, this way the entire address space can be split, right, that is our entire virtual address space can be split among the multiple users. And uh, uh, I said 10 different users creating 10 different tables, and we have not really said what will be the size of the table that could depend on the application, right. Maybe some people do not have many segments, and uh, some users may need more segments, and segment itself is a variable size. So, depending on the application, right, so they could they can have. Now, what happens, suppose when a user loads his program, his segment descript descriptor uh, table will, will have to be referred to and so the corresponding, huh, the start address will be loaded by who? It will be loaded by the system, right, the system software will only ask for the user ID and then the moment he is allowed to make use of the system, the system software will load that particular address and the user will be taken specifically to his allocated portion in the memory, right. And uh, in the se segment descriptor, you can have all the access rights, protection, privileges and so on and so forth. Even among the users, if you want to talk about uh, uh, different uh, say privileges being given. Okay. For instance, uh, uh, suppose a system is being used uh, by a professor and uh, 10 students, right. Whereas, the professor will have access to all the 10 different students program area, but any student is allowed only okay, for his program area. He, so, you restrict the rights. So, in other words, the professor very much access a system, okay, but he also may be controlled by the inherent system software, fine, good. So, now what we are talking about is 
uh, having different uh, processes that is uh, processes or the other uh, term that is used is also a task. Now, what a process is, what a task is, we will presently see. So, by having different uh, tables and uh, appropriate registers, we can split the program, right? I split the overall program. Uh, first, we saw in general as a system user and more specifically as a task or a process. In other words, even a single application program may consist of multiple tasks. That is why we have the term something like a multitasking okay, CPU, multitasking system. Now, what is a task? It is another name for that is also a process. You also must be familiar with the multiprocessor, right? That is uh, slightly different because then uh, more than one CPU, that is what multiple processor, more than one CPU, that is what it means. Here, what we are talking about is um, a program can be split, for instance, say uh, two uh, tasks, right, which will accept two different types of data and then uh, say something like uh, integer numbers, one, one type, another one floating point number, right. And then it may uh, consist of say uh, say two different IOs. So we talk about uh, yeah, uh, an integer a processing task, a floating point processing task. Then uh, we talk about uh, an IO task one, IO task two, right? Some of them may be you may be able to carry out in parallel. Now, what is a task or a process? A task or a process is essentially an activity, okay, of the CPU which can be independently scheduled and executed by CPU, right? And anything across the task will be done through some specific communication procedure. That is, in other words, a task or a process is a program, an independent program by itself. The overall application program may consist of multiple tasks and then communication between the tasks or the process will be following some specific standard. Now, why this particular thing? So, that this can be modularized, right? So, that today a particular IO task may be meaningful. Tomorrow, depending on the technology development, we can remove that and then put something else, right? So, we can modularize this particular one. Now, support for such things, they come by having, okay, a set of tables which are independent. First of all, we said a user can have his own table, right? Thereby, think in terms of different segments, right? A single user can also have more than one task, okay? That also is possible. Now, you can keep on referring to the different tables by loading into this register the different addresses, correct? Now, that is supported if the CPU has these features. Instantly. Now, for instance, in, uh, let us take this particular page table. Suppose instead of a single register such as this as shown, which we had discussed earlier, which contains nothing but start address of the page table. Suppose this register is replaced by another table, let us say. In, okay, instead of a single register, suppose we have another table, then just a, try to extend and that table may be pointed to by this a similar register like this, forget about that. Suppose there is another table instead of a, a single register like that. Then each entry in that particular table, because we are talking about a table again instead of this. Now, each entry in the table, right, will act like this register which means each entry can point to different page table, that is what it means, agreed. And uh, all these facilities will help a very large software development, because when different uh, um, okay, members in the software group are working and developing, they uh, will uh, need to have all these facilities, so that they can create their own things. 
and then some of these tables they may make it accessible by another software developer and some of them they will keep only for themselves. So, thereby the communication between the software processes can increase. So, these are all features. Now, a register, a table such as this okay, and also sometimes special instructions meant only for this kind of register, okay. special instructions which may not be used by the user. Now, all these things must be supported by a CPU, which are meant for data processing applications. Okay. That is why you find that uh, with the uh, uh, CPUs, which can support all these kind of system features, that is generally we say features, which are needed for operating system support. Okay. So, they will all come under the data processing, at the data processing end. and. Uh, um, Somewhat complementary to this, you have the control application oriented processors. Okay. Good. Now, uh, let us uh, uh, not elaborate any more on this. I hope now you understand. A single processor, a single CPU, okay? we are not talking about multiple processors here. We are talking about a single processor dealing with different tasks or different processes. Okay, multi processing is not the same as multi processor. In the case of multi processor, we are talking about multiple processors. In the case of a multi tasking or a multi processing, we are still thinking only in terms of a single processor which is capable of dealing with different tasks or processes. Okay. That is, at the software level only it is multiple, as the hardware level there is only one processor. And what is the restriction of one processor? One processor can handle only one instruction at a time, can be in only one state. Bear this in mind all the time. Okay. Whereas, in the case of multiple process, multi processors, it is a different story. Good. Now, in uh, all our discussion, okay, we have said memory or let us say storage holds the data, right. Memory or storage holds data. Now, should it always be so? Is it that all types of uh, applications is like this? Huh? That is in general. In general, we say it holds data. Uh, data is the term we are using uh, not in any specific manner. It may be instruction or a data. Okay? And then, for better utilization of the CPU, okay, for CPU's uh, performance, utilization may improve, we had talked about memory hierarchy. That is, we said okay, memory holds something or a storage holds it. For instance, the page is here uh, or let us say a physical page is here, virtual page is here, okay. uh, but CPU always deals with the fastest memory. From, that is from performance utili utilization point of view. And so, we were talking about the memory hierarchy, but essentially memory holds the data. Should it always be so? Right? Now, if it holds the data, what type of data does it hold? It can hold only data which have been already prepared. Right? Is we may say that uh, stored Okay, or frozen data is what memory holds, stored or frozen. Now, in contrast with this, what about uh, say raw fresh data or let us say live data? We do have applications, right? Raw or live data which are being currently generated. It is something like a fast food kind of a thing. We have that, is it not? For instance, you go to a petrol refinery application that is in as a, in general a process control application. Okay. In general, a process control application. The data will be flowing to the computer which is carrying out this controlling of the process say from something like thousands of sensors distributed in the field. 
they also carry data, is it not? So these data will have to come raw, fresh, they will keep coming, right? Uh, so this any process control application, I said just refinery as one uh, example, right? Essentially where um, a lot of transducers placed in different places will pick up the data and then feed the system, right? Then another type of application in which let us say the user is interacting with the system, that is he is interactive, that is he keeps looking at the result and then he is manually in fact feeding in the information. So that is also a raw or a live data, is it not? It is not stored. See in one case the transdu transducers may keep checking the condition that is there in the factory or the field and then ge automatically generate the data. In the other one, manually this data is generated, correct? Now these data also will have to be processed. These cannot be stored in the memory. They can be stored provided uh, uh, the processing can wait, but in uh, quite a, a bit of situation you would find that in many situations you will find that it cannot be stored, it will have to be processed immediately, okay, that situation is very much there. So to support the flow of this data to the system, we need to have the appropriate uh, input output mechanisms, is it not? Input output say mechanisms in general or say devices. Hmm? In other words, the data that is going fresh into the system, they will be handled by the input output devices and what is the difference as far as the CPU is concerned? The CPU may take the data from say disk which is this system which is part of storage or it may take the data from the memory unit or it may take the live data from this IO devices. As far as memory is concerned, it is the same, but the important thing is most of these IO devices are slow. I would say majority of them are slow, right? Even in the memory system we had seen, storage is much slower than memory. And even in the memory subsystem, we said cache is the fastest, cache can match with CPU, but not the uh, main memory even. So when you go out from cache to main memory to storage to IO devices, okay, you are, the CPU has to keep dealing with slower and slower data, agreed? So that is the difference that is very much there, but nevertheless as far as the CPU is concerned, it has to deal with the data in a similar way, okay? So good. So if you introduce this input output devices into whatever scenario which we have uh, discussed involving CPU and memory, this is what we have been discussing, right? If you introduce this input output devices. Now, what are the various issues that are there and how these things can be tackled? So this will form the focus of our lectures in part 3. So in part 1, we are essentially talking about the processor and the processor related issues. Then from that, we move to the part 2 of this in this particular series, part 2 on memory, first we looked at different types of memory and then subsequently this CPU memory interaction. Now to this in the series of lectures to follow which form part 3, we will take a look at the input output devices or in brief IO. Okay?